Hello everyone, my name is Trevor Cully, and normally I host the History of Persia podcast. You can find that online at historyofpersiapodcast.com or wherever you're listening to this right now. James is busy with that annoying thing called work, but we didn't want this podcast to lie fallow, and I've been trying to think of a way to talk about Bronze Age Iran for a while. I think keeping the oldest stories posting new episodes will be a great way to do that. Unlike their neighbors in Mesopotamia, there is not a rich corpus of Elamite mythological literature. We know a fair amount about how the Elamites worshipped their gods, how they thought about the divine, what sacrifices they made, but we're seriously lacking in the oldest stories department. There is no traditional Elamite epic, no creation story, no version of the deluge myth, no great Elamite heroes, or at least nothing that has survived. Even though there are thousands of surviving Elamite tablets from almost as far back in time as Sumerian literature, no Elamite mythology was preserved in anything that has survived up to present. Initially, I'd wanted to find at least one Elamite story to add to this podcast, but I found exactly one paper about Elamite mythology, and this is what Noradin Mehdi Gamapana and their co-authors said in the introduction to Mythological Scenes from Ancient Mesopotamia on Elamite Cylinder Seals. Quote, No independent research on the Elamite myths has ever been conducted, and also the entire materials mentioned in this area have been performed in the form of studies to investigate the Elamite religion, that have already been published. It can be assumed that the main reason for this is that any Elamite text reflecting the nation's myths has not yet been found in the excavations, or has not been translated, or their translations have not been published. Also, texts mentioning the deities of this nation are most often religious texts, and they mostly deal with introducing a specific deity, the king's activities regarding the construction of temples for these deities, and, in a few cases, they are also limited to describing the religious activities performed to worship these deities. As a result, the studies conducted in this area have frequently been focused on the Elamites' religious practices and their religion. That's actually a great summary of what we have to work with here. If very academic sounding. No full Elamite myths have been identified in the huge number of clay tablets in either modern Iran or Iraq, and because of that we don't really have the information necessary to identify representations of those myths in Elamite artwork. Those representations exist, we have cylinder seals and reliefs clearly depicting some kind of stories, but no context to explain what we're looking at. As the title of that paper suggests, the rest of the article goes on to examine Elamite cylinder seals from Susa and discuss the ones that show scenes from Mesopotamian mythology. The only sort of Elamite myth I could identify and potentially tell in typical oldest story style are the stories of the goddess Pinakir and the god Humban, but only because the Elamites directly borrowed the stories of Inanna and Dumazid and changed the names. Presumably that happened with other stories too, we just don't have direct references. After centuries of regular contact with Mesopotamia, it's not surprising that cities like Awan and Susa developed an interest in stories about figures like Shamash, Inanna, and Gilgamesh. But Elamite religion was also very unique and must have had stories about their own gods and cultural figures. Part of this is not all that surprising. Even in Mesopotamia, most of the ancient Sumerian myths, like the Epic of Gilgamesh, actually only survived in tablets from later periods, 
like the reign of Ashurbanipal of Assyria in the Iron Age, when Mesopotamian kings and their gods were reaching new heights. Unfortunately for Elam, their cultural influence peaked in the 18th century BC under the Sukhulmas, and they don't seem to have participated in that later flowering of literature. Elamite religion was, like all religions, very complicated and highly localized. Different regions and different towns had their own local deities with distinct practices associated with them. Between the Elamite highlands, Susa, and documents from Mesopotamia, we know the names of over 200 Elamite deities, but about half of those are only known from Mesopotamian records that reference them or people with names referencing otherwise unknown gods. These were presumably local patron deities or the names for gods that were absorbed into the roles of more prominent gods in more prominent cities. Within the 100 or so gods we do know about from actual Elamite sources, an even smaller fraction actually have any detailed information associated with them. Some, even some that had whole temples of their own in the biggest cities, are only known from references to their name. We know about a god called Shak Amar Hanishta, who had a temple in Susa, but only because one brick was found explaining that this was a temple to Shak Amar Hanishta. One brick. Susa is by far the best excavated city from Elamite history, but it has also been continuously inhabited for more than 6,000 years, and the old city center has been destroyed and built over many times, destroying or hiding most of our good evidence for Elamite religion. Still, there seem to be three distinct categories of deity in Elamite Susa. Gods that originate in the lowlands around Susa itself, gods imported from Mesopotamia during one side's occupation of the other, and Elamite gods that originated in the highlands and arrived in Susa when one of those dynasties had control over the lowlands. Within all of those categories, there are distinct phases. Some gods last all the way through, while others enjoyed periods of increased popularity before fading into obscurity. Before going too much further in this episode, I should also introduce a bit of terminology. When talking about the changes to Elamite gods and religion over time, I'll reference the Old Elamite period and the Middle Elamite period. Old Elamite corresponds roughly to the Early and Middle Bronze Age. So everything I've discussed so far from the beginning of history to the end of the Sukalmas. Going forward, I'll be talking about Middle Elamite history. This corresponds roughly with the Late Bronze Age beginning around 1500 BC. So Old Elamite transitions to Middle Elamite circa 1500. After the looming social and political collapses at the end of the Bronze Age, all of these familiar civilizations like Hittites, Babylonians, Assyrians, and Elamites get a fancy Neo-whichever prefix around 900. A lot of the most detailed information about Elamite religion comes from that Neo-Elamite period, and actually more of it even comes from documents relevant to my own history of Persia. For convenience's sake, I'm going to pull just a little bit on that information for basic descriptions of the gods. I'm not going to dwell on it in this episode, because there are just other episodes of this podcast that deal with them way better, but Mesopotamian gods were hugely important in Susiana and the Lowlands during the Old Elamite period. They existed alongside Elamite gods and were often even more popular, 
This slowly began to change under the Sukalmas, but outside of a few exceptions, like in Shushanak, the Elamite gods only became the dominant gods of the Susiana region going into the Middle Period. In lieu of great storytelling associated with the Elamite pantheon, I still want to do a rundown of some of the most prominent gods, excluding the more familiar deities borrowed from Mesopotamia. Many of these gods first appeared in writing in the treaty between Naram-Sin and one of the Awanite kings, but their exact roles and importance varied drastically over the course of Elamite history. Others are known largely because they were exported to Mesopotamia, much like Sumerian and Akkadian deities were imported to Elam. A list of gods and their descriptions, called the Ananum, served as a guide for Mesopotamians to understand these foreign deities, and conveniently, serves the same purpose for modern historians. First up, we have in Shushanak. Where else could I start but the Elamite king of the gods and god of the kings? But of course, he didn't start out as the head of a pantheon. Like many, many ancient Near Eastern gods, in Shushanak started as the patron of a particular city, in his case, Susa, but much like Asher in Assyria or Marduk in Babylon, when Susa became a prominent and powerful city, in Shushanak was elevated with it. It's a bit difficult to figure out when this happened. It was clearly already in progress when Puzor in Shushanak ruled as the last Awanite king in Susa around 2100 BC, but at that point, the Elamite and Akkadian gods were so interwoven in Susa, and Susa was pretty disconnected from the Elamite highlands. Still, the unified Elamite kingdom at the end of the Awan dynasty probably helped push in Shushanak to the top of the evolving national pantheon. As a sort of king in heaven figure, and Shushanak was seen as the protector of the weak, the guarantor of public welfare and royal authority, and the guardian of a kind of nebulous cosmic order. King of the Gods was not in Shushanak's only role. The aspect of in Shushanak that ordinary people would have dealt with, and probably his original role as the god of Susa, was as a god of death. In Shushanak was Lord of the Afterlife, who weighed the souls of the dead and judged their morality. As an extension of this divine role, he was often called on to bear witness in contracts in the real world, with the implicit suggestion that violating the contract would count against you when in Shushanak went to judge you in the afterlife. One of his primary temples in Susa was even called the hot shoe, literally the tomb, to reflect these duties. The slightly bigger temple in Susa was still dedicated to his role as king, and was called the Ekuanana, the pure place of heaven. Despite his immense importance, in Shushanak was never worshipped widely outside of Elam. Instead, he was usually identified with other Mesopotamian gods who had similar jobs. When talking about contracts, he could be Shamash. As king, he was like Ninurta, and in the underworld, he was like Ereshkigal. But oddly enough, his friends spread far and wide. As god of the underworld, Enshushinak was accompanied by a series of lesser gods to act as his assistants. During most of the Old Elamite period, with its occupations from Akkad and Ur, this assistant was usually Nurgle, but by the end of the Sukomas, local deities started to take over that spot. Ishmi Kerub was a bit like in Shushanak's law clerk or notary. He was also a witness and guarantor to laws and oaths, and his name literally means he who grants the prayer. 
Ishmikarib was adopted by the Assyrians as one of several divine judges who adjudicated the souls of the dead. In Alam, this lesser death god position went to Lagamar, who basically just replaced Nurgle as in Shushanak's intendant in the afterlife. He might have had some kind of role akin to an afterlife prosecutor, or a punishing fury, since he was sometimes called Lagomar without mercy. At the height of Elamite power in the 18th century, he was listed as a god with a temple in Mari, all the way in Syria. In the first few centuries of Elamite history, in Shushanak's main competitor for theological dominance was the god Humban, patron deity for the city of Awan. Humban shared many of the royal and legal duties that became associated with Inshushanak, and rose to prominence alongside his own city. While Awan was the dominant city of Elam, Humban was riding high. He even had a massive festival in Susa itself when it was under Akkadian rule. However, after the Akkadians were kicked out, even the Awanite kings transferred their attention to Susa and in Shushanak, and so Humban became less and less popular. He stuck around as a relatively minor god, though, and eventually outlasted in Shushanak in the Neo-Elamite period. Unlike in Shushanak, whose mythology is still poorly documented, we do know a little bit more about the stories surrounding Humban. Humban's father was the god Yabru, an Elamite god who is actually only known from Sumerian documents. His exact role isn't all that clear. Sometimes he's compared to Anu, other times to Enlil. In a text called The Underworld Vision of an Assyrian Prince, Yabru appears as another Chthonic underworld deity. Humban's mother was the goddess Murun, but we really only know about her because she's identified as the wife of Yabru in Mesopotamia. We also know that Humban had a wife in Elamite mythology, the goddess Pinakir, a goddess of love, sexuality, and warfare, who had a lot of cross-pollination with Ishtar. Like Ishtar, she was also the goddess of Atsams, inns run by the temples of Pinakir that provided food and shelter as well as religiously sanctioned prostitution in the name of the goddess. A lot of artwork and descriptions of her in Elam were similar to artwork about Ishtar in Mesopotamia, but she was also subbed in for Inanna in several myths, she also had some of the motherhood and fertility goddess traits of Ninhursag, at least while the Akkadians were in charge. Her cult centers were primarily in northern Elam, possibly in Awan or Shemashki, and her fortunes were closely tied to those cities. Pinakir remained popular for a bit longer than Humban, lasting into the Shemashki period, but as Anshan and the cities of the Persian Gulf became more important, gods from those cities took on many of her important roles. Humban was sometimes treated as the same god as Napirisha, the patron deity of Anshan, but they were definitely different. Napirisha rose up in Elamite society when Anshan became more important, and he had many of the same legal and royal duties as the last two city gods we discussed, but with some unique twists. First of all, he just has a cooler name. While in Shushanak just means Lord of Susa, and we don't know what Humban means, Nepirusha literally means the Great God. He also doesn't seem to have been worshipped in temples in his own city something unique among the major Elamite gods. Instead, the Anshanites made their offerings in open-air sanctuaries to call on Nepirisha as a public god. When his cult spread out in the Middle Elamite period, 
King started building temples to Napirisha in other cities so that he could be worshipped in the more standardized way. He even shared with Inshushinok at a temple in Susa. When Humban was replaced with Napirisha, Pinakir was superseded by Kiririsha, literally the great goddess. It's not clear if Napirisha and Kiririsha were consorts in Elamite mythology before, or if they were only associated with one another as an extension of Humban and Pinakir. But eventually, Napirisha was considered the husband of Kiririsha. Their names do make it sound like they were already a pair in southern Elam before Anshan got too powerful. Kiririsha was the Lady of Liyan, an important port on the Persian Gulf, and while she took on many of the same traits as Pinakir in the long run, she was very clearly a war goddess at her core, and her temple was decorated with battle axes. Unlike all of the other gods we've discussed so far, Kiririsha didn't make it out of the Bronze Age, and references to her vanish altogether after about 1050 BC. In the Middle Elamite period, Inshushinok, Napirisha, and Kiririsha formed a sort of divine triad in Elamite religion. They were the first gods invoked in official ceremonies, and each acted to guarantee Elamite royal authority. The first two were the guardians of royal power and Elamite law, and they balanced power between the primary cities of Susa and Anshan, while Kiririsha seems to have been in charge of all of the fun stuff, love, sex, family, and warfare which also happened to be the things that gave legitimacy and continued the royal dynasty. Next up is another divine couple. First, we have Simut, technically the first Elamite god to appear in writing, since Sargon recorded the defeat of a king called Sanam Simut. Simut was called the Herald of the Gods, associated with the planet Mars, and compared to the Sumerian god Nergal, all of which probably means he was a war god of some kind. But he may also have adopted some of Nergal's underworld roles after extended Mesopotamian contact. Simut shared most of his temples with his wife, Manzat, the goddess of the rainbow. She was another god that became very prominent under the Sukulmas, and her cult spread all the way to Syria. In addition to rainbows, she was also the protector of pregnant women, who would make offerings at her altars before giving birth. Many of the Elamite gods operated in groups. As we've seen, some were couples, and others we only know about in the context of being part of a larger group of affiliated gods. One of these groups was called the Napratep. We know almost nothing about them, but they're mythologically important because they were known as the creator gods, as in creators of the universe. It's possible that they may have included a god whose name I mentioned in a previous episode, Ruhurator. He was primarily a guardian of treaties with other nations, but he may also have been a kind of Prometheus figure, or at least the god in charge of creating humanity. The text which describes it isn't very well preserved. Another better understood collective was the Igigi. These were seven gods who appear in very old Elamite inscriptions. They are sometimes called the seven wise men, the seven gods of the sky, or even the seven gods of Elam so it's entirely possible that the group included other gods I've already discussed. The only one we know for sure is a god called Nahundi. He was the god of the sun and conflated almost one-to-one -one with Shamash from very early on. So he took on a role in protecting legal decisions. Nahundi is also the very first god called on to protect Naram Sin's treaty with the Elamites. Nahundi should not be confused with his sister, the goddess 
Narundi. She was called the goddess of Susa, which may be a hint that Inshushinak himself was initially one of the seven Igigi, because she is also their sister. A few hundred years of Akkadian rule later, and she was compared directly with Inanna as a goddess of mothers, but first and foremost, she was the Elamite goddess of victory. Eventually, this meant victory in legal disputes, victory in battle, and victory in general. But initially, that meant victory in battle against evil demons. We don't know much about Elamite demons, but the one we actually have a description and a name for would have been Narundi's arch-nemesis. The demon Lamashtu was blamed for infant mortality and puerperal fever. So that probably gives us at least a sense of what demons were for in Elamite mythology. They were the causes of horrible misfortune in the real world. Finally, I just want to include one last god who is, by all accounts, a relatively minor figure, and yet another god associated with legal proceedings. But I think you'll see why I like him. This is Shazi, god of the river ordeal. It is not clear from the surviving contracts and legal documents if Shazi's job was literal or metaphorical, but crueler punishments existed in the ancient world. Many Elamite contracts invoke Shazi to pass legal sentence on anyone who breached the terms of their arrangement. Violators to these contracts were to be thrown into the river, and a section usually ended with the phrase, May the god Shazi smash his skull on the rocks. If it seems like too many of these gods overlap in their jobs, especially in the legal world, this is probably because we don't have a good assessment of how they functioned in day-to-day -day life. Most of our most detailed surviving references to Elamite gods come from Mesopotamian texts that try to compare them to Mesopotamian gods, or legal contracts invoking the deities at Susa. Only a few particularly useful funerary texts and recorded prayers really open up a window into day-to-day -day religion. One thing that becomes immediately clear is that the ruler, whether he called himself a king, a governor, or a sukulma, was intimately connected with the gods. Many of the Elamite gods were regularly invoked to protect the throne and guarantee royal authority. On the other side of the same coin, the king was the leader in all things, warfare, hunting, and religion. The actual high priest always accompanied the king, apparently even following him into battle during times of war. Below him came the rank-and-file clergy, with priests and priestesses alike holding a high social rank and dressing in similar costumes with long hair and big horned crowns or headdresses. Priestesses in particular were usually called on to act as legal witnesses to contracts, and they probably officiated marriage ceremonies. Priests apparently participated in ritual cleaning and bathing before performing their duties. Several texts and reliefs reference a hand-washing ceremony each morning before a priest could begin his duties. And we even have a bronze model of two nude Elamite priests performing some kind of ritual bath in public before some larger event. These larger events could have included many things, but they definitely included the grand processions and feasts that seem to be a core part of Elamite religion. Carved reliefs and seals depict processions of people led by priests, but including musicians, singers, and animal sacrifices traveling up to the temple precincts in the cities or out of the cities to holy sites in the countryside. The animal sacrifices would in turn have been slaughtered and cooked to provide food for the feasts. The most important of these feasts, at least in Susa, 
was the Feast for the Lady of the High City. Which goddess this was isn't exactly clear. It could have been Narundi, it could have been Pinikir, it might have been Karirisha, depending on the point in time. Even if that was the holiest day in the liturgical calendar, the biggest party was the celebration of Elamite New Year at the beginning of each autumn. This celebration was called the Feast of the Pouring Offerings, in which pouring refers to the huge quantity of animal blood spilt in the sacrifices before everyone in Susa had a massive barbecue. When they weren't partying like it's 1999 BC, the temples also acted as everyone's least favorite parts of a functioning society. Landlords, banks, and courts. Elamite temples, like their neighbors in Mesopotamia, owned large amounts of arable land and collected rents and revenues from that property. But on the legal documentation for tenants, their landlord wasn't the temple as an organization. Instead, their landlords were literally the gods themselves. In Shushinak, Simut, Shamash, and a lesser god called Uperkubak are all listed by name as the landlords in Elamite contracts. By the same token, Elamite temples also acted as lending institutions. Ancient religious organizations the world over became long-standing stores of wealth built up from both property and offerings, and they could provide loans at high rates of interest to other, more worldly landowners and merchants. Finally, the temples and priests played a major role in the Elamite legal system. As I said, many surviving documents are legal contracts, and the gods regularly acted as guarantors or witnesses of those contracts. But the god Shazi was not alone in punishing violators. He just got the most colorful slogan. Most of the prominent Elamite gods were also associated with the concept of Kiden, which was both divine order and divine protection. An individual deity's Kiden was symbolized by a physical charm or totem that was housed in a special room of the temple. Oaths were sworn while touching the Kiden, like a Bible or other holy book in modern courts. And criminals sentenced to execution were touched by the Kiden of whichever god was passing their sentence to revoke that god's protection. The largest temples themselves usually took the form of a ziggurat, the step pyramid-like buildings from Mesopotamia, but these monumental structures were often part of a complex or a district within the city, surrounded by smaller, rectangular temples for minor gods and ceremonies. The main ziggurat in Susa was the Kukunum of Inshushinak, which was supposedly topped by a set of horns in imitation of an Elamite priest's headdress. Grand as some of these temples were, they were not necessarily the most important part of religious devotion for many Elamites. Outside the city walls, or even within the walls of the temple districts, there were also open-air sanctuaries. Many of these holy sites were marked by otherwise isolated reliefs and inscriptions carved into mountainsides. Some of the most important open-air sites were the temple groves, wooded areas that served an important role in the passage from this life to the next. Above all else, everyone in Elamite society could rely on the gods to participate in their death. The Elamite gods' overriding purpose was to give and protect life while you had it, and then carry the spirits of the dead into the afterlife. Almost every god from Inshushinak on down was somehow associated with death. Deceased Elamites were taken to the temple groves, wrapped in matting made from reeds or grass, and left out for a short period. It was during that time when the body was exposed in the grove that Inshushinak was supposed to judge their souls. 
Once this requisite period of mourning had passed, it was time for burial. Over the course of almost 3,000 years of Elamite history, different people from different classes used almost every form of tomb and grave imaginable. Some were placed directly in the ground, others had coffins, and still others just had their long bones and skulls sealed in vases. Presumably, wealthier people had small brick mausoleums or deep shafts where successive generations were buried one on top of the other. Really, the only consistent trait of Elamite burials is that they always had offerings or grave goods. And even that ranged from peasants and simple pottery up to the nobility buried alongside gemstones and chariot wheels. Given this preoccupation with death, it is kind of surprising that no archaeologists have ever firmly identified the tombs of Elamite kings. It's entirely possible that we just haven't found them, or they were so thoroughly looted and damaged centuries ago that they are unrecognizable. At least one Iron Age Assyrian king went on to boast about destroying the tombs of the Elamite kings. So that's a definite possibility. But for now, the Elamites are a long way away from the Iron Age, and this is where I'll leave things for now. Elamite gods overlapped in many different ways, least of all their roles in law and death. These overlapping duties reflected different geopolitical and regional hegemonies as previously independent city-states became more and more unified. Many supreme gods and many mothers of the gods and many gods of death were slowly unified into a single pantheon as many cities got used to being part of a single Elamite kingdom. And next time, it will be Susa's turn to commit to either being Elamite or being Mesopotamian. Hopefully, this isn't too much of a break with tradition. Once again, if you want more from me or to skip ahead in Iranian history, you can find the History of Persia podcast on historyofpersiapodcast.com. Thank you for listening.